They're starting a new series in the book of Habakkuk this week. It's just three chapters in three weeks. And this is a very unique book. You can find it at the end of the Old Testament. So if you hit Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you, you've gone a little too far. And the hope is, as we walk through the Bible together here at Grace, that by the end of this three weeks, you would have a real grasp on this book. And it's a very unique book in the Bible as well. So Habakkuk is having a conversation with God, and we get to listen in to this this in-depth conversation. I want to encourage you as this series starts to think through one area in your life that you really want to process with God. One thing that you're going through that might be difficult, you have questions, and as you face it right now, take the next three weeks to really go deep and process that with God. Now, as I think back on my own life and some of those major pieces You know, processing my parents' divorce. That was a a, a very, you know, big event in my life that I had to work through with the Lord. Also, I had a a life-threatening illness. Uh, There was a career change in my life. Uh, And I think about premarital counseling. We had really intense time of trying to figure out, Lori and I, are we supposed to be together? Does God want this? And working through that time, uh, we had several miscarriages. And so we walked through that with the Lord. Uh, Career moves or moves in different jobs and adoption recently. And I've had family strife in my extended family. So there's been a lot of different things. And you, as you look back, you might think of how God has walked you through different seasons of your life. And one of the reasons for looking back and seeing that is to gain confidence and trust that the Lord can also walk us through this time and what we're going through right now. And so uh, think about, again, one specific area that you really want to open up to God and have a conversation with God as we go through this book because that's what Habakkuk is doing. He's processing. So let's take a look in Habakkuk chapter 1 starting in verse 1 and it starts out like this. The oracle that Habakkuk, the prophet, the oracle that he received. And so uh, Habakkuk, a couple things about the background here this book. Habakkuk is someone who's a thinker. He's aware He's a prophet. Uh, He's sensitive. He's caring. He's sincere. You might relate to him on on many of those levels. He's educated as well. And he receives this oracle. And an oracle is a pronouncement. It's a revelation with warning. It's kind of weighty what he receives. But he receives it from God. And a lot of times with the prophets, the key verb is to see. Uh, Has a to see. And sometimes they're given a vision or a dream from the Lord, but other times God's Spirit so embeds a message into their lives and into their being that it's almost as clear as seeing it, but the Holy Spirit has brought them a word and a message and sometimes a foresight and sometimes just an insight to what's going on. So Habakkuk has received this from the Lord, and historically it's about 600 years before Christ. So in Israel at that time, there were 10 tribes in the north. They were called Israel and two tribes in the south called Judah. Now about a thousand years before Christ, you know, King David was leading and all 12 tribes were united. But as as it plays out, it turns into 10 in the north, two in the south. The 10 in the north were taken into exile by Assyria and now there's just two in the south. And what's happening amongst those two tribes? Well, there's a real decline, drifting away from God, drifting away morally as well. Jeremiah would be a peer, who's another prophet during that time. Jehoiakim would be a king during that time. If you like history and you want to go through kings and chronicles in the Bible, it'll tell you one king in one uh, just sequence after another of how things are playing out in the country. So as this is happening... Babylon is increasing as a world power. It used to be Assyria, but now Babylon is rising up in power. And and so the the, uh, prophet is watching this happen. He's watching his own nation and the decline that's happening. And he's processing all this. Here's what's unique. Prophets usually talk to people about God. Habakkuk is going to talk to God about people. Prophets usually make a declaration Habakkuk has a dialogue with God. So these three chapters are his dialogue, how he's wrestling, this conversation, asking, listening, going deep. Here's the first principle. Honesty and depth can lead to a greater trust in God. Honesty and depth are good when you're trying to build a trust with God. 
Uh, it could be scary to open up and go deep with God. I know when I became a Christian, that took a long time before I really started to go there with the Lord. It might be a little bit awkward or uncomfortable to open up and go deeper, but Habakkuk knows he's not going to avoid, he's not going to coast, he's not going to deny, he's not going to try to stuff, he's going to actually go to God with what's most on his heart. And so that's where he goes. Let's take a listen to uh, what he shares with God, and this is chapter 1, verse 2. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. The prophet has a broken heart. And if you had a broken heart, what he sees, he just feels like is unbearable. What he sees in the land, what he sees in the nations, this decline. He says the law is paralyzed, which literally means the law is cool, the law is numb, and that the law has been knocked out. People are trying to knock out the law and uh, just do what they want to do. And there's violence and there's injustice everywhere. It feels to the prophet like he's outnumbered, he's overpowered, and where is the justice? So he cries out to God, and this key word here in verse 3 is violence. Uh, Hamas, violence, six times in this short book, he talks about violence. Someone violating another person, someone wronging another person, someone injuring another person, and that kind of injustice. And it's not just in his nation, but that's how nations are treating other nations. Do we see that today? Absolutely, we see it, the same kind of violence. And so these whys build up inside the prophet. And he said, why is there so much evil? Why is there so much injustice? Why does it continue? Why does it look like evil is triumphing? Why? And he's asking God, and then God, when I cry out to you, why does it feel like you don't hear, you don't respond? Intellectually, the prophet knew that God hears But what he meant and what he was really saying is that, God, you don't save. God, you don't rescue. God, it appears like you're not bringing action. Like I would hope and expect. How long, oh God? How long? And when someone cries out to God, how long? Usually they're in agony. How much longer, God? How long? David would cry out to God in the Psalms and ask the same question, how long? In Psalm 13, he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And maybe that kind of language isn't the way you would share with God usually. It's throughout the Bible. It's deep. It's raw. Asking honest questions, seeking the Lord. It's not just to get intellectual facts. There's a relational component to this. And David and Habakkuk and their relationship with God are trying to work through some things. And uh, the principle is do not let destruction and injustice undermine your faith. Do not let injustice that you see and destruction that's around us, don't let it undermine your faith. Habakkuk is a godly man, and he there's a stirring, there's a restlessness. Uh, There is a sense that things aren't right, and he's perplexed, he's puzzled, he's hurting. And you know what? It tells us you can follow God and love God, and you go through times when you are perplexed and struggling and grieving and hurting and trying to make sense of what's going on in life. And that's exactly where he is right there. Maybe you're right there today. Uh, here's the temptation. When we see injustice and we see evil, the temptation is to do one of two things. To conclude that God is not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. Or he's not loving and compassionate. Because in our limited understanding, we assume that if God was all-powerful and God was loving, he would fix this, he would do this, he would change this. And so as we try to process, a lot of people will push out and say, well, he's not all-powerful because if he was loving and all-powerful, he would do something. He's not doing anything, so he's not all-powerful. 
Or they would say, well, he's not, not loving. He, he has the power to do it, but he just doesn't care. He's not compassionate. So your view of God is one of the most precious things that you have in your life. And you need to, when you go through difficult times, be thinking about, okay, who is God? And God is omnipotent. God is loving. So when, how does this play out? What, what's going on? If we hold on to those true truths, which we should, and they're true, then how does this play out? Well, it's at this point, I think, that a lot of people wander. A lot of people become hard-hearted, become disillusioned. Uh, they think, okay, God, if you're not going to show up and do this, well, then I'm going to distance myself from you. And a lot of people start to put up walls in their relationship with God, and, and that's the point right here. Uh, in what's going on at the core of it, pain and disappointment. Disappointment and pain. So God, hard heart towards you. I bet you know a lot of people who are right there. Uh, in my family, when I came to know Jesus, and this was back in the 80s, uh, in my family, there was over 50 people in my extended family, and I didn't know any of them that were following Jesus. And so, uh, you know, what's happened during those years, those 28 years, I've seen four come forward and say, you know, yeah, I, I love the Lord. I decided to put my trust in Jesus. I've seen four. That's a lot of waiting and praying 28 years in, in four people. But I'm grateful for those four. But as I get to know my family and their stories and their history, and so many of them grew up in church even, but, you know, at the core of what was happening was disappointment and pain and maybe experiences in church where there was hypocrisy or it was dead or there was lies and there was double lies. And that so, that pain and disappointment so turned them off that they decided, no, we have no interest in God or the Bible. And so people at that point make their decisions and some of them just say, I'm walking away. Um, now, I continue to just love my family, and sometimes I wonder, like, how many and how long? The most difficult thing, I'll tell you, in my life is being at a funeral with someone I love, and they've died, and they've rejected Jesus. And I've been in that situation with my family, even when I'm leading the funeral, but they've rejected Jesus. And I think about those realities of eternity and peace with God and how much God loves us and wants all to go to heaven, but then everyone makes their own decision too. And so um, I don't know what you wrestle through. I'm sharing some of the things that I, the deepest things in my life that I try to work through and figure out, God, what are you doing here? But Habakkuk is sharing that. And my encouragement is when tragedies come, and they will, when trials and trauma and tension and it all builds up, it's okay to look forward and to have an outlook and to try to figure out what's coming up and, and it's okay to plan and all that. But a look up is so much better than a look out. And a look up is what Habakkuk is doing because looking up is the only way I'm really going to find peace and joy and hope and perseverance. I've got to have that look up. And you're the same way, looking around. You're not going to find someone. You need to look to the living God and connect with him and go deep with him in the middle of what you're going through. So Habakkuk is doing that. Now let's take a look at God's answer. Drop down to verse 5. The Lord answers, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if it were told to you. And the application is that God will reveal amazing information to those who seek him and listen. God will reveal amazing information to those who seek him and listen. Job lost everything, but he kept crying out, seeking God. God revealed who he was. Paul wrestled with a thorn in the flesh and other trials, but he kept seeking God and Jesus would speak to him. Mary was pregnant, and Mary said, how can this be? I'm a virgin, and God, how can this be? And, and seeking God, and God said, well, you're pregnant through the Holy Spirit, and nothing is impossible for God. And Mary said, I, I'm your servant. You see, when you're sincere and you seek him with all your heart and you really listen, God is a loving God who's so personal and communicates, and God will answer. God is answering Habakkuk right here. I watched a video clip recently and have started to share it. John Piper, it's one of his messages, and he's talking about a point. He's a pastor in the Twin Cities where I grew up, and there was a point where the church was having all sorts of challenges, 
and uh, he felt discouraged, and he got away for two days, and he rented out a room with no distractions, and he pulled out a blank piece of paper, and he just said, God, what do you want to do with me? What do you want in my life? And John Piper refers to it as a gospel ambition. And God, what have you made me to do? What should be my focus? And I encourage you to, to take some time and move your cell phone out of the way. Move your smartphone out of the way. Turn off TV for a while. Get alone with God. Get a piece of paper and just identify and listen to the Lord and say, God, you know me. You made me this season coming up, the next five years, the next 10 years. What do you want me to focus on? What is primary? Right now, Lord, what do you really have for me? And it might be to be the very best mom. It might be to do something in our community. It might be to go overseas. I don't know what it is. He knows your gifting, your personality, your wiring, your relationships. But if you make it available and just say, God, I'm seeking you, please show me. And just start to write down and ask him and listen and write down that sense. And then start to share it with some other people when you're done. Um, Acts 13, 36, it says, David served the Lord in his generation. What are you going to do in your generation to really serve God? The Lord. Habakkuk is trying to wrestle through this. You know what's interesting? This verse, Habakkuk 1 5, it's quoted in Acts chapter 13 that I just referred to. Paul and Barnabas are speaking, and they're saying to the crowd, Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for God is going to do something in your days that you would never believe if someone told you. So, in Habakkuk's context, God was going to use the Babylonians in a way, to rebuke and bring people back to the Lord. Uh, when Paul and Barnabas are sharing to the crowd, they're saying God is doing something. He sends his son, dies on a cross, risen, and salvation is for Jews and Gentiles in the whole world. And so don't mock it and scoff it. God is doing it. God is doing things in this generation. And those who seek and listen, tuned in, are going to be a major part of that. But we're all invited into that. And so uh, Habakkuk listens to God. God starts to explain what's going on. And it's not the answer that Habakkuk thought was coming and wanted to hear. That's the thing about listening to God and surrendering to God. It might be a different plan and answer than what you thought it was going to be. And then the crossroads is, will you still trust him? So Habakkuk is figuring out, what is this plan? And do I really want to trust him? This is the plan. Listen to what God shares. Verse 6. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves. They promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like the sand. They deride kings and they scoff at rulers. They laugh at all the fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and they go on. They are guilty men whose own strength is their God. The Babylonians, what a description, also called the Chaldeans. Now, the international landscape at that time, I mentioned Assyria was the number one superpower in the world. Well, the Babylonians, as they rise up in power, they're going to go into the capital, Nineveh, and they're going to so destroy the capital, Nineveh, that people later on aren't even going to know where was Nineveh. And that was the capital of Assyria. And then Egypt was another major power, but Egypt, almost you know, overnight it seemed, was suddenly gone. There was a battle in 605 at Carchemish, and Necho II. Well, the Babylonians took the Egyptians down, and people were astounded. I mean, can you imagine if a major power in the world today was just taken out? And so there they go. And then Judah had been enjoying independence and prosperity, and they were in 586 going to become subject to Babylon. So Babylon is rising up. Nebuchadnezzar is the number one power in the world that day. And who are they? This is what Habakkuk says. This is what God says and agrees. They are ruthless. They are dreaded. They are a law to themselves. They are promoting their own honor. They are swifter than a leopard. 
I remember watching a, a Planet Earth video where an elephant at night is just captured, devoured by all these leopards. They are fierce. These people, Babylonians, are like vultures. They just sense the kill from, they can smell it. They, they can travel away. They'll take advantage. They'll scavenge. Uh, Habakkuk refers to an east wind. In that culture, there was an east wind that came from the desert. And you didn't want that east wind because it would pick up sand. It would devastate the crops and it would cause so much destruction. And so the Babylonians are like that east wind that nobody wants. They laugh at cities. They say, wow, you think you built up a wall around your city? We're coming right through. And they had no mercy whose own strength is their God. They would push God aside and say, our military, our strategy, our army we're tops. We're tops. Their own strength was their God. And God saw all this, and the principle here is that God demonstrates his unrivaled strength to people who are self-reliant. People who are self-reliant, self-sufficient, self-promoting, self-righteous. Why do people want to remove God from the picture? Because deep inside, well, the Babylonians, they wanted to be at the top. They didn't want God above them. They didn't want authority there. They wanted to be tops. And we all have that same battle, removing God so that we can call the shots. And God's going to show up in a unique way here. We've got Judah, who's resisting God. Then you have the Babylonians, who are all out rebelling against God. And the Babylonians are going to come into Judah The hope in all this would be Judah would have that wake-up call and return to the Lord. Uh, That's that's the the, the goal here. That's the greatest thing that could happen. But Habakkuk hears this, and he's feeling like, God, I really don't like this plan. I'm having a really hard time with this plan. I don't know how I can trust you, God, if this is the plan. And have you ever been there? It's the apex. And look at Habakkuk as he's inside feeling, I don't like this. Have you had those moments where God says, yes, and you say, no, and God says, yes, and you say, no, and there's this back and forth going on? Well, no, you're too spiritual. You never had those moments. You never, you can't relate to that. But uh, that's right where he is. And what is he going to say? What's Habakkuk going to say? Verse 12, he says, oh, Lord, Are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O Rock, you have ordained them to punish. And I just highlight that Habakkuk, what does he say? Lord, everlasting, you keep all your promises. My God, you are holy, you are the Holy One, you handle injustice. Lord, my Rock, he is going to stay in faith when he's having the very hardest time with God's plan. He's going to stay in faith. And I encourage you, when you're wrestling with God and his plan, to say, I can trust God with this. Even when you don't feel like trusting him, it doesn't feel good what's going on in life, just to declare, I can trust God with this. That's what Habakkuk is doing. I can trust God with this. He's going to go from faith, include a whole bunch of more questions, and then there's going to be faith. It's kind of like a little sandwich here. But in his most intense wrestling, it's affirming faith. Then there'll be a lot more questions. And he's going to hold on to faith. He's going to stay in faith and in the faith community. Here's his questions. Look at verse 13. He says, God, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Habakkuk is saying, God, this makes no sense. God, if I'm sinful and I see the Babylonians and what they're doing and it's deplorable, God, you're holy. How can you see this and tolerate this or let this happen? God, if this is so hard for me, 
How are you not taking action? And I want to point out the difference between asking God and questioning God. Asking God is, God, help me understand. This doesn't feel good. This doesn't make sense. I'm trying to, to just figure out who you are, what your plan is right here, God. And so Habakkuk's going to continue because this is not what I anticipated and what I wanted. So God, I'm going to ask you. I'm just going to ask you. That's asking God. Questioning God is something different. Questioning God is when you say, God, I know what's best. <laughs> God, my plan and my ways are superior. God, I think you made a big mistake here. God, let's get with the program. That's the difference. So humility keeps us in asking. And what you picked up on, I'm sure, I mean, the tone of this first chapter is in worship, part of worship is to passionately go deep and get raw with God and seek Him and listen right at the places that mean the most to us. And so, I mean, I commend you. Like, you're, you're here in Hungary on a holiday weekend when streets are closed and someone ran into a pole and electricity issues all around us. Like, you found an entrance into church. Like, you got here. Like, you're, you're hungry for God. And I just encourage you in this time, whenever you're in this place, that this would be a place where you could meet with God, that I could meet with God and listen and ask Him questions and go deep. And worship isn't just, you know, oh, what song are we singing? Worship is we're here to meet with the living. God and draw near to him. And that's what this place is all about. And when we do that, he changes us and he communicates with us. So go, Habakkuk knows he needs an encounter with God. Deep crying out to deep. I encourage you to not settle for less than deep crying out to deep and an encounter, a personal encounter with the living God. And so um, here's the, the application. Hold on to God's character when you do not have the answers that you want. When, when life isn't giving you what you want, hold on to God's character. My pastor back in Dallas, Texas, when I went to church there, uh, E.K. Bailey is his name. He's now with the Lord. Uh, taught me so much. But he would say, when you can't see God's hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart even when you can't see his hand. Like I said, you start to declare out loud, I can trust God with this. In my limited understanding, I don't understand it all, but I'm going to trust God with this. Uh, one of the themes in the book of Habakkuk is time for reflection. And we live in a busy culture, and I encourage you to really take some time to reflect as we go through this book. And so reflection is important. I just had uh, my 25-year college reunion and it's like, where did that time go? Uh, 25 years. And as I started to think about the 25 years, okay, so I graduated when I was 21. I'm 46 now. I'm thinking if I keep working, and I, let's say I retire at 71, that would be halfway through my working years right now if I retired at 71. I don't really look forward to retirement. I just love serving the Lord. So I hope it's like later than 71, to be honest. But let's say that's halfway through. It's like, wow, that's already halfway through. Uh, we, at the reunion, uh, there was a time, it was a ceremony for the people who have already passed. We have a lot of classmates who aren't with us anymore these last 25 years. And so they asked me to lead a time, but uh, life goes by so quickly. And as we were doing some more reflection, I started talking to a friend who went to the same college, and he was sharing the story. He said, you know, in college I was dating this girl, and my heart were so, and it was, heart was set on her and getting married, and that was the plan. I mean, that had to happen. That was, you know, tops. And you know what happened, he said? The, the relationship deteriorated. We broke up. It was crushing at the time. He says, but now I can look back 25 years later, and she has just completely pushed Jesus out of her life. And, and he says, I am so grateful that we didn't get married. Uh, he said, God had protected me from that. And so what happens? Sometimes the prayers that you're asking for, you know, God, that we could get married, and then you don't get married and you look back later and you say, wow, God, that was one of the greatest blessings you ever gave me is that that relationship didn't end up in marriage right there. I'm just saying there's a 25-year perspective that's different than a right now perspective. And you don't know the next 25 years and God may be protecting you from some things that feel disappointing at the time, but later on you're going to look back and say, thank you, God, for answering my prayers that way. Actually not answering my prayer, doing something completely different. Um, and, and similar to me, 
as I think back 25 years ago, as I showed up at college, well, now more than 25 years ago, uh, there was one guy in our class, his name was Mike. He lived down the hall from me in the dorm. And at the time, I thought, well, that's just Mike. He's kind of quiet. He's introverted. Mike was the first Christian that I ever met and got to know as a friend. And Mike was a guy, as I look back 25 years later, it's like, I think through our whole class, I don't know anyone whose walk has been so consistent and solid as Mike. And so there he was on my dorm floor, and I'm thinking, like, this is not coincidence. I mean, God just, what a gift that Mike was there. And I'm so thankful Mike had some courage because he was an introvert who deeply loved Jesus. But he, you know, it was a big step for him to share Jesus with me. And I'm so glad that he did. And I look back at that and it's God's provision that God would place a guy like Mike on my dorm floor so I could learn more about Jesus. And God is providing for you. At the time it was just Mike, but 25 years later you're going to look back and you're going to say, wow, that one person, that one day, that one event, that one time in church, God did something amazing to show his love to me, and I'm so grateful. So we all had to write blurbs for the 25 years, and I just shared my story as much as I could in a Dartmouth style. Vox Clementis and Deserto, a voice crying out in the wilderness, was on all our notebooks. It points to John the Baptist. I just tried to refer to that, but I just wanted to share with people um, that You know, as time continues to march by, another 25 years, another 25 years, another 25 years, that everything else really fades, but Jesus doesn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In peace with God and with Jesus, there's just nothing more important. It becomes obvious when you reflect. And so Habakkuk's reflecting, and the word he uses is rock. And that's what I want us to think about, rock. Moses also had a song in Deuteronomy chapter 32, and he included the name for God, Rock. Moses is someone who had a lot of questions. God, why are we in slavery? God, why did I mess up? God, why are you asking me to get involved? God, why are you asking me to speak? Why is the crowd so unbelieving? Why can't I get into the promised land? I mean, there was just, there was a lot of questions for Moses in his life, but this is what his song was. He says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 3, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways are just. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. Saying God is the rock is not only saying truth, but it's reaffirming, it's honoring him, it's valuing him. He is our stability. At the time of the book of Habakkuk, They had so many religious ceremonies, but their hearts had drifted away from God. I was pulling something out of the oven this week. I grabbed that um, little glove you wear when something's hot. I grabbed the pan, and it just burned right through. And uh, I was surprised. I thought that was protection, having that little glove, and it burned right through. The mindset in Judah at the time was, well, as long as we have our ceremonies, we're fine religiously. We just do our ceremonies and we're fine. And there was a false confidence in just checking the outward boxes and being religious in the ceremonies, but not really having a connection with God. Their hearts were far from God, even though they were in some of the rituals. So we're going to take communion together. And it's not just a ritual, but it's a time to connect with God. Our take home is this, when life feels disappointing and frustrating, you can be raw with God because he is still your rock. He is still your rock. Habakkuk is going to stay in faith at the end of chapter one and say, okay, God, I'm watching. I'm going to continue to listen to you. It was a process. This book is a process. Our lives are a process. And before the answers come, there's no great Hallmark card statement at the end of chapter one. There's no ribbon to tie around it today. You just have a prophet who loves God, his heart is crushed, and he's trying to make sense of it all. So as we start to prepare now for communion, let's continue to seek the Lord in the process. Go deeply with him. I'm going to also just refer to Matthew chapter 26, and the praise team can come forward. And in Matthew chapter 26, don't forget that Jesus was wrestling with the Father's plan. Jesus was wrestling, and he prayed three times, Father, if there's any other way, but not my will be done, your will be done. In that Garden of Gethsemane, that cup of suffering, Father, if there's any other plan besides the cross, let's go with that plan, but ultimately, God, your plan, not mine. And we take communion together today, Because Jesus trusted 
the Father's plan. Jesus continued to trust the Father's plan. And as we prepare to take communion, we're going to take it remembering that Jesus trusted the Father's plan and also as a time where we would commit to God, we want to trust you and your plan even though life is so difficult sometimes. So the elements are going to be passed to you, and I encourage you uh, just to wait till everyone has it. We're going to take it together in a minute. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for a book like this that is so raw. And uh, Father, it's easy for us to just try to grab entertainment or excuses or distractions or just more things and own more things and possessions instead of seeking you in an encounter with you and going deep with you. So Jesus, we pray that during this time of communion, we would take this time to reflect what you've done for us, your death and resurrection, what you want and how you want to lead and guide us, and that we would trust you with your plan. And uh, guide our time of reflection now as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen.